Hello there, friends. Welcome back. Gonna do a little different type of video today. Gonna roll up our sleeves a little bit more, tinker a little bit more, and uh, have a little bit of fun today. And I'll, I'll tell you why. I have these two boxes of 35 millimeter transparencies. The, you probably know of these or have at least maybe seen one before. They're two inches by two inches, and uh, they have a, a color image, a transparency in the middle. And one of the one of the very first ideas I put on my list of video ideas for this channel long ago was a video where we take a look at some of these slides. I thought that might be interesting. Now, there's a personal connection to the content of these slides, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in the next video. But for now, the main thing standing between me and making a video where we look at slides is that I had no way to actually look at the slides. I did not have a slide viewer. So I did a little research on that. I discovered that you can still buy brand new slide viewers, which I thought was interesting. You can buy a simple handheld battery powered slide viewers and you can still buy more pricey uh, viewers with digital scanners in them that will let you, you know, create image files of your old slides for archival purposes, that sort of thing. But I didn't want to, you know, spend a lot of money for just this one video. And, and something, a, a brand new slide viewer seemed a little bit out of place for what I wanted to do. So I took a look at eBay, of course. And uh, there's a lot of great stuff on eBay, new stuff and used stuff and vintage stuff. And I found a viewer, an old viewer that needed some maintenance. And I thought, you know, for five bucks, which is what they wanted for it, and less than five more bucks to have it shipped, I thought if I buy this vintage viewer and can get it working, that would make a, a neat tinkering video on its own and set us up well for a slide viewing video after that. So that's what we're going to try to do over the next two videos. We're going to tinker with a vintage slide viewer first, try to get it working correctly, and then we'll take the next video and look at some slides. Look at these slides right here. So to that end, I pulled the trigger on the item on eBay. And here it is. I have not opened it yet, as you can see. I 
think it might actually be easier or quieter to go in through the bottom. So why don't we try doing that? And once we take this out of the box and you're able to see it, I, I hope you'll see why I picked this particular one because it's got a it's got a characteristic to it that, that I found uh, appealing for what I wanted to try to do with this video. So let's see. two Wasn't too bad. packing peanuts. So far, so good. You can probably tell already that this is the small handheld battery powered type of viewer. This little stand is not attached. Whether we can get it reattached or not, that's not really going to be too much of a problem. And here we have it. This is a small Panaview 2 by Sawyers. And 
as I hope you can see, it is made of glittery red plastic. You can see the glitter inside there. Which I just thought was perfect for taking a look at some vintage color slides. So this is the item we're going to take a closer look at and see if we can get working right for our, to help us out with our next video. Now, if you are unfamiliar with slides and slide viewers, as I expect at least some of you would be, because uh, this is a few uh, generations old after all, let's talk about what we have here and and how you're supposed to use it. This is the Panaview 2 viewer by Sawyers. And what's interesting is if you go to Amazon right now and look for a slide viewer, they still sell a small viewer called the Panaview 2. So this, this type of a small handheld battery powered viewer is still sold today under the same uh, brand name, although a different company makes it now. This was made by Sawyers. Sawyers was actually the company that invented the Viewmaster toy back in the late 1930s. I had a Viewmaster when I was a kid. My brother had a Viewmaster. They were a great toy. The, the notion that you could hold up something to your, to your eyes like a pair of binoculars and see a 3D image in the viewer was was quite impressive. Um, Sawyer's, the company, got acquired by a company called GAF in 1966. But then GAF continued to use the Sawyer's name on slide projectors after the acquisition which makes something like this a little bit hard to date. But I would assume that it's no, it's no newer than uh, the early 70s. I kind of hope it's uh, from the 60s, though. But anyway, so how you would use one of these is you would take the slide a color slide here. It's a little cardboard frame with a transparency, a color transparency in the middle. The transparency is actually the, the negative material that's been processed to be a positive, a color positive instead of a negative, and then used for the slide. And the idea here is that you would insert the slide into this slot. And then you'd push down and you can see that there's a little bit of springy give here. That's because when you push the slide from here to here, it is pushing on a little switch that would make a light 
come on behind the slide. The light would come through the slide and then you would be able to view through this lens here. You can see the slide inside the viewer as I push it up and down. And when you push the slide down, the light comes on. And when you let go to take it out, the light goes off. Or, if you didn't want the light to be coming on and off all the time, you could use this, this little pusher here, which is designed to push down and click into a... Uh, it locks into a down position. So there it is in the up. And there it is in the down. And when it's in the down position, it is pushing on that switch all the time. And so that would keep the light on all the time. And you could just put in slides and take it out, put in the next one and the light would be on all the time. So that's, that's how it's supposed to work. Now, these sellers on eBay said in their listing that this was being offered for display or repair because they could not get the light to come on consistently and stay on. What they said was that they could get the light to come on when they moved the batteries around. So in terms of troubleshooting and tinkering with this guy to make it work better, the, the statement that they made on their eBay listing um, is, I would say, good news for us. It tells us two important things. One is that the bulb must work. If it comes on at all, then the filament in the bulb must be okay. And that's good news for us because I don't have any spare uh, b little three volt bulbs of the type that this would take. And the other piece of good news is that the wiring or the conductors that create or that make up the circuit in this viewer must be intact. If the light comes on at all, that means that the, the conductors must at least be in place and intact to complete the circuit sometimes. And that's also good news for us because if this viewer used wires and one of the wires were broken and needed soldering, we would be we'd be in trouble because A, I don't have a good uh, high temp soldering iron in this house and B, I'm absolute rubbish at uh, soldering anyway, and uh, any attempt that I would make to try to fix this with a soldering iron would not be something that we would want to see on video. So, so their information from the eBay listing uh, should actually be encouraging to us. Hopefully with a little bit of tinkering, we can uh, make this thing work better and um, use
use it in our next video to look at some slides. So with all that, let's take these two pieces apart and see what we see. So they come apart very easily. I think most of our time is going to be spent with this piece on the right. So very briefly, let's take a look at what we see on the piece on the left. So we see that there's a little, almost like a, uh, the dome you would find in a flashlight. Uh, although instead of reflective silver, it's just white. This is to uh, help disperse the light and hopefully illuminate evenly the white screen that we see in the very back of the viewer when we look down the lens. You can see that there's no hole for the bulb uh, visible when we look this way. That means that this must be behind a screen. And we can see down here, this is a little plastic tab that goes down when we Yeah, there it is. When we push down the slide, the little tab goes down, and that would push on the switch that's in the back of the viewer. So that's really all that's happening in this front bit. So we'll set him aside for a moment. Let's set him aside. So everything else is happening here. Now when we're trying to tinker with something like this, or make it work better, uh, whenever you're trying to figure out the root cause of why something is not working, particularly something simple like this. It's important to use the information that we have well in terms of using common sense and interpreting where, where it's leading us, right? Um, when, when the sellers said that the, the only time they could get the bulb to come on was when they moved the batteries around. That tells me right away that the most likely issue we have here is a contact problem related to the pieces of metal that the batteries touch when they are in place in this battery compartment. So even though there's no diagram about how to arrange things here, I think you can see that one battery would go here in this area, and there's a piece of metal there and there. And then I think we can see that a second battery would go here. And there's a piece of metal there and there. Now 
the other good news thing uh, when we open this up is that we see that there are not any wires in this battery compartment. Instead, all the electricity is moved around with these wide copper strips and that's also good news for us because that means there are no wires uh, to break and it's very unlikely that there would be a problem with any of these in terms of conducting because they would have to be they would have to be broken all the way across and separated by air for for uh, for any of these to be holding up the flow of electricity. So that also bodes well for our ability to fix this guy. You don't actually have to be an electrician to kind of understand what's happening in this little battery compartment. I'm not an electrician, although I took some basic, you know, electrical engineering classes in college. But you don't even have to have that. In fact, one of the most common sense ways I've ever heard simple circuits described is uh, a water and hose analogy. If you can understand water flowing through a hose. I think you can get the basics in your head about uh, electrons or current flowing through conductors or pieces of metal. In fact, not to get too uh, academic here, but I made a little drawing. This is, uh, this is a very simple, crude drawing of what's happening in this battery compartment. Even though these pieces of metal are kind of bent at odd angles and kind of going all over the place in here, all that's really happening is what you see on this piece of paper. You've got batteries, you've got a bulb, and you've got a switch. You know, the switch is down here. Remember the plastic tab in the other piece of the viewer? When it pushes down, it pushes on this little tab here. And when that is pushed down, the circuit is completed and the current flows just like water. I have a couple of batteries here. These are double A, common double A, one and a half volt batteries. And if you play with handheld video games or you're a parent and your child has a bunch of battery-powered toys, you know all about how batteries are used to power small devices. And, and often, uh, a game or a toy will have more than one of these batteries. And the reason is because if you take a couple of one and a half volt batteries like this, and you connect the positive end of one of them to the negative end of the other, like this, you've now created a 3-volt battery. And so when we look at our little drawing, You can see here on the battery side, 
this long line and short line is the symbol for a battery, and this shows that we actually have two of them connected together just like I showed you. And when we think about water and hoses, you can think about a battery as like a, um, oh, like a, a recirculating pump because it's always spitting out electrons from the one end. And as long as there's a way for the electrons to get back, it can receive electrons in the negative side. And it will keep doing that throughout the life of the battery. So in this simple circuit, the battery sends electrons out the positive side and they get to the bulb. And as the current flows through the bulb, the filament gets hot and that's what produces light. Then the electrons come down to the switch and as long as this switch is closed, so that the electrons can flow through, the water flows through the hose, then they continue on their journey back up to the opposite side of the battery again. That is all that's happening here. Three components and plumbing to connect the components in a loop. And as long as the loop is continuous, the water should flow and the bulb should light. So, how does that apply back to our little battery box? Well, like I said, if you, uh, if you take two batteries and connect them together, you get in effect, a battery with twice the voltage. But in probably every toy you've ever seen, the batteries are side by side. They're not end to end. So how can they still be connected when they're side by side? And that has to do with some of the wiring or the conductors that we see in this box. So if we look, I don't know if we can get the light right here. If we look at this side of the box, we see a piece of metal that's all by itself. It's not connected to any of the other pieces of metal in the box. It's this guy right here. See him? This is the piece of metal that connects our two batteries together and turns them into a three volt battery. Since one battery goes here and it touches here and here, and one battery goes here and touches here and here, that means whatever battery end is touching here is connected to whatever battery end is touching here. So as long as we make sure that one of the batteries positive is here and a negative is here, then we have created the equivalent of this. then what that means in terms of the rest of the business in here is that everything else must represent the other parts of the drawing that I showed you. So we have our battery. Our battery is sending and receiving. Sending to the bulb through the switch and coming back. So if this end of the box connects the two 
batteries together, that means these two must be the send and receive. And we can actually trace the flow of the, of the water in this box and really simply understand everything that's happening in here. So if this, if that's the positive, then we can follow this piece of metal. The current would go here and get to the bulb, just like our picture. It gets to the bulb because the outside of the bulb here is metal. See the, the base? It goes from here into the filament. And then it comes out the bottom of the bulb, right? We know what light bulbs look like. Comes in through the copper base, and then comes out the little lead bit at the very bottom. See, we're actually tinkering in this video. So, current goes from here to the bulb here, comes out the bulb down here. The lead bit at the bottom of the bulb touches this piece of metal, which leads right to the top of the switch. So now we're here. So when we push the switch, while it's pushed, while it's pushed down and connected, the electricity flows to this bottom piece of metal, which sticks out here and leads to the back side of the battery. That's the whole, that's the whole journey. That is really all that's happening here. Which means as long as the batteries are good, as long as the filament in the bulb is good, and as long as all the pieces of metal are intact and all the contacts are being made, that's all that has to be in place for the circuit to work. So we can see some corrosion here. One thing about battery compartments, of course, is that if batteries are left unattended for too long, they can sometimes go bad and leak acid. So sometimes in old battery compartments you'll see acid damage and corrosion that can ruin it or at least affect the flow of current. So if we take the feedback from the eBay listing at face value and assume that the biggest issue is with the contacts with the batteries, then that means the, the bits that should get our attention today are the pieces of metal that actually touch the batteries when the batteries are in place. Actually, I guess it would make sense. 
Now that I think of it, it would make sense for us to put batteries in first before we try to fix anything and see what it does, right? Not that we don't believe the sellers, but I guess we want to we want to verify what the behavior is first before we try to make anything better. I guess that makes sense. So we'll take our two batteries and we'll put one here and we put the other one in the opposite direction. see that when we push the switch we do not get light. Let's see if I move them around whether I can get ah, there we go. So we can see that with just a little change in position, either makes the circuit work or makes the circuit not work. So this confirms what the seller said and really makes it look like we've got to give a little bit of attention to these four contact points here. Okay. Let's take these back out. that is the real culprit here is this side. Let's see, I don't know if the light's a little problematic here, but these two these two metal tabs have a little sharp raised area on them to try to help make better contact. I doubt that you can see that. But this side is different. This side is completely flat, so it's made to except the positive end of a battery that has a little bump on it. And then this side has a little raised area here in the copper. So that's meant to be up against the negative side of a battery that is flat. So since there's nothing sharp about either of these, I'm going to guess that most of our connection issues are right here. So what can we do about that? Well, I've got a small piece of slightly used medium grit sandpaper here. And I've got a finely calibrated 
precision writing instrument, the Ticonderoga Black HB2, with a black eraser and everything. And I thought maybe if we can wrap a little bit of sandpaper and get it down into here so we can sand a little bit on these areas. That might be a good first step. In fact, I'm inclined to take the bulb out for now. I would hate to break it with this uh, pencil. Let's see if I can make this. I wonder if I need a smaller piece. doesn't look very effective at all, does it? Maybe I was overthinking that with the pencil. might not be the most enjoyable sound you've ever heard on this channel, but hopefully it's not too grating and horrible. Okay, it looks like we've got a little better copper exposure on both 
ends of that piece of metal now. I think I'll do a little of the same here, but on this side I want to be sure that I'm not I'm not taking down any of the sharpness of these little raised areas here because I think that's that's crucial that those still be sharp in order to make good contact. I really kind of want don't want to do much at all to those. Why don't we retry the batteries just from, just to see if the work on this end helped out. Got to put the bulb back in. Trying to find a position of the batteries. Well, I think we might have improved our situation. Seems like it comes on every time I hit the switch. Sometimes the light seems to fluctuate a little bit or wavers in brightness, but maybe just that amount of tinkering got us back in the game. Why don't we put the two pieces back together and see what it looks like through the lens. Hey, look at that. Seems strong. And when the pusher is locked down, seems to stay on okay. In a dark room it might even light up the sparkly red plastic a little bit better. Let's see, why don't we grab our test slide from before. Oop. Let's put it in right side up, shall we? Let's see, can you see this? Looks like a uh, 
a water skiing scene. You've got a person in the foreground and you've got a skier following behind in the background. That's pretty cool. And then we'll finally reattach our little metal stand. Let's test it with the uh, with the pusher unlocked. So the light comes on when we push the slide down. I think we're in business. I think we have a successful bit of tinkering here. I bet for the next video I'm going to have to get the camera very close to the slide viewer to get good views of these slides. But we will deal with that next time. So I think we're in... Uh, I think we're in good shape. We have brought our red sparkly plastic pan of U2 back to life. Learned a little bit about how we can think about electricity like water. And I think we've set ourselves up well for the next video where we will take a look at the rest of these slides. forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much for joining me. Bye-bye.